when I was 15 and one of my best friends was murdered by my side. What made you feel as though you were powerless, as though you were vulnerable? I'd be a liar if I didn't say I haven't thrown huge effort and huge focus. I was wow. shot at, at outside the house, bullet went through her front door. I actually thought it was salvation wow. and it was to save me too. Hello, my name is Nisi T and welcome back to BEBB. -E so on the show today, I have a very special guest who is, I would say, an amazing guy. An amazing guy who has an amazing story and changed his life around. I'm not going to give too much away because I'm going to let him do most of the talking. But thank you so much for joining us today. Carl Loco. Thank you for having me. No, thank you so much for being here. How are you? How's everything going? Yeah, we're good, man. We're good. A little bit flustered. A bit flustered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bit of a rush to get Definitely, here. Definitely, but we're here now. But you're here Great now. Job. So I'm so, so glad to see you. So obviously, just in case people don't really know much about you, yeah. I think that the, off the top of my head, I can say uh -huh. you are a poet. Yes. An amazing one at that. Oh, thank you. you. You are uh, an activist who yes. works very closely with communities. Yeah. Um, you are also a speaker as yes. well. Again, yeah. amazing at that. <laughs> and on top of that as well, you are a YouTuber. Yeah, oh, which wow. is amazing. That's a, new one. a YouTuber yeah, as well. That's a, that's a new one. Yeah. Doing very well on YouTube Thank though. You. Um, with obviously your lovely wife that's Cassandra yeah. Loka as well. Um, but yeah, just in case people don't really know much about you. Mm. Who is Carl Loco? Okay. Wow. You know, I always get thrown off. <laughs> Don't delve in too much because we're going to go yeah, into that. Whenever but... they ask me, Carl Loco, do you know it's mm. Definitely, I do poetry. Right. You know, um, I love words. I've mm -hmm. always loved words. And for me, everything's about communication. Mm -hmm. So if we go from the, um, from the YouTube to mm -hmm. the activism to um, the public speaking to the poetry to the creative writing, it's all about communication. So for me, I feel like I am a communicator, mm -hmm. you know, and I communicate in order to build bridges. Right. So I like to call my, I like to see myself as a bridge. Mm. You know, so Carl Loco is a bridge. Yeah. Mm. A bridge. I really like yeah. that. Yeah, Carl Loco is a bridge. That's actually the shortest I've ever answered that answer question. Answer that question. I'm trying to. I know. I'm I know. You probably don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna delve a little bit more into who you are and mm -hmm. that sort of thing anyway. So don't worry, you're still going to be able to um, express a bit more. But um, one thing that's particularly interesting about you is that obviously you are actually quite open with your history. Yeah. You have a very interesting history, if we can call it that, <laughs> yeah. um, where you've been involved in quite a lot of different things. And yeah. um, even in your YouTube channel, you did mention that you were involved in a gang yeah. um, in the past. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Mm, I can. I mm. can, definitely can. You know, um, so mm. I know that's a hard one because yeah. it'll be like it was a. Pro I'm sure it was a process and a journey. Yeah, so absolutely. But yeah, is absolutely. there anything that particularly stands out for you? Mm. I would definitely say it was misguided zeal. Right. Yeah. So um, I've always wanted to um, affect my community positively. Mm. You know, I've always wanted to. I don't know. Build those bridges. Mm. You know, I, I did feel as if we were displaced. You know, I did feel like we didn't have an identity, mm. a feeling of powerlessness, right. you know. And initially, my 12-year-old brain, like, kind of assessed the terrain and said the solution must be mm. to um, gangsterism, you know, right. to join a gang. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough clout to join a gang, right. you know, so I ended up making my own gang. And the gang was very, it was just very juvenile, right. very innocent. You know, mm. and it was other young men that was in a similar situation to myself. Mm -hmm. So they were just as afraid as I was, right. just as displaced, you know, um, and wanted that sense of belonging too. Mm. So I just created a vehicle for that, right. you know, and... Um, and where was this? This was so, obviously in yeah, London. In Brixton. In South Brixton, London. right, yeah. South London. So um, it started initially on Mandela Estate, Wow. which is, um, yeah, just an estate in Brixton, mm. not far from my house. Mm. And yeah... They, I ended up basically just selling them a dream, wow. you know, but I believed in that dream and so mm. did they. What you was know? the dream? That we can forge our way, you know, that we don't have to be powerless, mm. that we don't have to be invisible, insignificant, mm. you know, that we don't have to live like with that level of vulnerability, mm. you know, that we can be empowered. Right. I actually thought it was salvation right. and it was to save me too. You know, it wasn't yeah. just like, uh, we all felt mm. like we needed something but what, more. But what made you, sorry to interrupt yeah, you, no, but what made you feel as though you were powerless, as though you were vulnerable, as though you, I guess, left in the background? What made you feel like that? Because because we technically was. Mm. Like, in what obviously way? Obviously, we're um, lower working class. Mm. Um, we're, we're privy to 
the reputation our community has. Mm. You know, um, I was the son of illegal immigrants. You mm. know, just even their quiet footsteps is always to be seen and not heard. Mm. You know, so, yeah, just that whole feeling, being a young black man, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, just the reality. You know, obviously, my opinion hadn't totally formed yet. Mm. I, hadn't, I didn't know what I know today. So I, I could feel that there was something not quite right. I could feel there was a gap, there was a gulf, a divide, you know? So, yeah, it was to address that and we could all feel it. Mm. You know, we did know that there were some that could afford to live a certain way right. and we couldn't. Like, I did know that some others had a Christmas tree in their house after. Mm. Like, I, me and my brother actually asked my parents whether we could not put up the Christmas tree. Because the connotations of a Christmas tree is that you're going to have presents. Oh, wow. You know, but obviously my, my dad, he, he sat us down on one Christmas and was like, you know, I feel like you lot aren't are aware of the situation. Mm. You, lot, you lot feel the struggle too. We're not going to act like you guys are oblivious. Mm. So this year, do you mind like foregoing mm. um, Christmas presents? So yeah. we're like, absolutely. You know, right. just kind of just... Just little... Almost in, adapting yeah, to, to the yeah. environment. So it did feel like a solution. Right. It did. Yeah. You know, we weren't there. We were troublemakers, but we were trying to solve a problem. A problem. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so obviously you've, you've you know, touched upon so many different things. You've talked about, obviously, the economical aspect. Mm. You spoke about it socially and yeah. not really feeling like you, I guess, had a say and that you were yeah. vulnerable. So what was it that, because you said you were 13 when you yeah. you started a gang yeah. of your own. Yeah. So what did that gang give you? What did Ooh. it, how did that make you feel? Sorry. Um, I'd say overnight, just by mm. saying that this gang is, exists and we are a part of it. Yeah. Gave me immediately mm. a feeling of belonging, um, a bit of confidence. Right. You know, I felt like, um, wow, there is a, um, there's a future here. You know, this this is something a, a level of ownership. Mm. You know, you got, yeah, you get to yeah. have something it's that like, yeah, is this yours. Belongs to us. Mm. You know, um, yeah, it just felt yeah immediately empowered overnight celebrity mm -hmm. in my own mind. Yeah, and that's where it matters the most. Mm. You know, internally it did it did it did touch me in a way. It touched mm. all of us. We mm. all felt it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And what would you say was a distinguishable moment? Because obviously I've I've heard you speak before, and mm. you know you've you've mentioned times where some insane mm. things have happened. Yeah. Um, and I remember there's one that, that you mentioned. I don't know if you want to go into it mm. um, right now, but what would you say was a distinguishable moment or a memorable moment just growing up in that time frame when you still had that mindset? Wow. Mm. Do you know, I'm, I, it's, it's really... It's, it's quite challenging mm. to paint a picture of what it was. Mm. Um because of what, how it is currently, you know? Yeah. So um, I would definitely say those times when we first started the gang, it was very, very juvenile, mm -hmm. very innocent, not heavy, quite light. Then it got pretty dark, right. you know? And um, I would say almost every day there was an encounter of sorts that has stained me mm. mentally to a degree. Um, but if we're talking about a, a, a situation that maybe left its print on me in a positive or a negative way. Either way. Either way. Mm. Um, I would say maybe when I was 15 mm. and one of my best friends was murdered by my side. Wow. You know, um, and at that was 15. At 15, yeah. That was two days before our GCSE exams as well. Mm. You know, so like mm. he was stabbed in the heart and the blood was propelling mm. from his t shirt. Mm and lifted his um, his T-shirt in the air, mm. you know? So that's always stayed with me. That's, a, that's something that did make me a lot less remorseful. Mm. You know, whereas to some, it might have been a deterrent. Mm. So it had a, a, a would you, like, in the long term anyway, where you yeah. could have ended up, it had more of a negative, oh, absolutely. negative effect on you. Yeah, rather yeah, than... it was like, oh, we need to be more ruthless. Right. You need to be. We need to be more aggressive. Mm. You know, we need more. And then it kind of turns into a vicious circle, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Then it even got to the point where it's like we owe others that level of pain. Wow. You know, mm. it, it really got dark. Mm. You know, and um, yeah. So yeah, so many like 
situations where mm. when I got cut on my face initially because I got stabbed wow. in the yeah, face when I was scarring. um I think I was 15 as well yeah I think I was oh maybe I was 14 14 or 15 mm. I got cut on the face and my mother Mm. she couldn't really now it's done she done so much for it you know she brought out all the African sort of remedies the like remedies that, that aloe vera, sting everything all of that stuff, <laughs> we have to firm you know firm the pain trying to get rid of the like all these scar removal techniques yeah but initially it just kind of was like that it just oh my like God. my mother would be talking to me like how I'm talking to you yeah and she would talk to me to a point then you could kind of see her eye kind of just looking at it. right and then she will be just have to look away so she'll be talking to me mm. and talking to me like this because mm. it just hurt her to see that it kind of i don't know it just kind of maybe captured what mm. i was becoming you know so that was quite a yeah a real moment yeah there's lots of them every day it's, it's, it's hard to articulate a world where mm. every single day you're seeing a level of violence or mm. an act of violence whether you're on the receiving end or giving end, but it's constant. It don't turn off. Mm. It happens every day, maybe sometimes several times a day. Mm, which I'm sure does you know? a lot to you mentally. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And um, obviously you've you've mentioned it um, just now, and I don't um, want to stick on the subject for too long, but yeah. so you obviously mentioned that, that the person that got stabbed next to you was your best friend. Yeah. So that's somebody that you would have considered as regardless of what you were involved in or what you were doing, that's someone that you must have held very dear and very close to you. So I guess, um, because a lot of the times when things like this happen, people just see it as another face, another Mm. person. But then they forget that these people had friends, they had family, that even though they've maybe gotten down the wrong path, they still maybe needed love and affection and, and, um, you know, just that support. Did you ever feel that your... Were your family still very supportive of you? Did they try to help you? Did they try to get you out of those kind of situations? The answer is yes. Mm. Were they effective? No. Right. You know, I'm hence, you know. <laughs> but it is it is hard mm. because they wasn't privy to any of that sort of lifestyle. Mm. You know, I grew up in a household where mm. um, any sort of waywardness is just unacceptable. Right. You know, my parents don't use profanity, let alone break the law. So even though they would try, they had the effort there, they had the intention there, but they they didn't have the ability to get me off of that. I don't think anyone did initially. Mm. You know, it did look too attractive. It looked too appealing. Mm. It did look like a solution. Mm. You know, again, we're trying to solve a problem. Mm. That's why I speak about this misguided zeal. Right. You know, so, um, no, they tried. And failed. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, right now, where you are today yeah. is absolutely incredible and it's amazing. And, you know, I don't want to dwell on the the, yeah. the more negative so much because yeah. um, I I do want this to show that there is there is so much more. Mm-hmm. And that's something that you really advocate, even on your, your YouTube channel, for example. Yeah. You know, there, I think you you um, were gallivanting in, yeah. uh, ne- is it Necker or Mecca? Necker. Necker Island, right? Necker Island. Just yeah. doing these kind of things. <laughs> I don't know how he does these things, but um, you were kind of, yeah, showing that, listen, you can go from Brixton yeah. to this. Absolutely. Where you are now doesn't have to necessarily be the end. Absolutely. But, you know, and you haven't allowed that to define you either. Mm. And that's, I think, the most beautiful thing out mm. of your story and out of you because you now use it as kind of like a, a guidance to say, I was there, but mm. I, I came out of it. But what would you say um, made you get to that point or made you change your mentality to say, this is really not for me anymore. I need to look for something else. Mm. There was no big bang. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it wasn't like one day that just kind of hit me. Like something miraculous yeah. happened. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's not my truth. You yeah. know? For me, it was a lot more, a lot more um, various small bangs mm-hmm. that equated into, a, wow, this is not acceptable. This mm. is not life. This is not winning. Right. You know, because the deception is that you're actually attaining something, that you're doing a level of good, that you're mm. solving a problem, that you're winning to a degree. But when the, it was unveiled to me that that wasn't winning, but I was actually losing, <laughs> mm. that for years I had classified certain things as a gain, as an advantage, and it was actually a loss. And when that hit me, and that hit me, I don't know, there was on various occasions, you know, um, where I would hear certain statements. Like, I, I remember there was a conversation from... Um, one of the young men in my community, he was like one of the pioneers before us. And he would have been called an older to a degree, but 
I kind of left that behind when I was 18. But until then, he was like one of the older boys in, in the area. And he basically, I remember one day, it just felt like he had lived for it. All of his siblings was involved to a degree. You know, he had family uncles that was also involved to a degree. And one day he, he just saw how enthusiastic and zealous I was about it and my contribution. And he was just like, he just pulled me to the side and he was like, you know, this doesn't actually mean nothing. Wow. He's like, you know, this ain't actually real. Mm. So this is somebody that's actually in Involved. this life. I mean... Deeply in this life. They were who I was trying to... Aspire to. Aspire almost. to. Right. You know, to a degree. You know, and they had seen that I had become. And they're watching me. And they've seen the transition. And, you know, he had a soft spot for me. And he's like, you know, you're doing, you're being, you are. But, you know, we're still paying council tax in these areas. Mm. Council estates that we don't own, you know, people are dying for it. Like you, 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 your, your friend died the other day and the council estate stone is still here. You know, like that needs to be, you know, so those little things like that kind of, but it's not enough to shift. Mm. You know, I would say the real um, full blown shift came through um, a lady called Pastor Mimi. Wow, yeah. yeah so. I've seen, I've seen yeah. Pastor Mimi. Yeah. We, we need to have a sit down with Pastor <laughs> Mimi because she just seems like, yeah. number one, she's on fire for God, which mm. is beautiful. And then secondly, she just seems like the most amazing person. And she did a lot for you guys in the community, she's didn't she? Force, Opening up her doors to she's you. and She's a force. I was wow. shot at, outside her house. Wow. Bullet went through her front door, got stuck in her blinds. Um, she was one time almost arrested with all of us because... Um, one of my close friends was a fugitive on the run and he had ran into the house. And um, she was literally, sometimes there'll be young men that was we were at loggerheads with mm. outside the front door, balaclavas on their face, firearms outdrawn. You know, um, the borough um, police force, and that was like how she couldn't have services because wow. she was a minister. Yeah. She can't have services unless there are police officers wow. inside the building. You know, so she went years, every service, with two um, uniformed police officers in the building while she's doing service. You yeah. know, she, 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 yeah, she, she rolled with us. Yeah. She's about that. She's That's about amazing. that life. Yeah. So if you think that there's no, there's no incredible people like that, yeah. Pastor Mimi is one of them. Absolutely. Definitely. So Thank let's you, fast forward a little bit. Yeah. So obviously you've been on this journey. Uh-huh. You've come out yeah. of it. Yeah. You're here today. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what Carl does now. You know what? Carl is an anomaly. Yeah, <laughs> Carl is definitely. I don't know. It's why do you say that? Why an anomaly? Why? Because one reason why I find it so hard to articulate exactly what I do, okay, is because I had the revelation quite early on mm. that I am not gonna fill a vacancy spot, right? But the world is vacant of me, mm. so I'm just gonna offer me. So because I offer me. Mm. It's not a vacancy I filled, you know, so it is quite vast in regards I, I, I consult government here and abroad. <clears throat> um, wow. I've done advisory and do advisory for CSR departments of um, corporates. Mm -hmm. It's like your KPMGs your, um, and blue chip companies. Mm -hmm. um, I do activism here and abroad, you know, so I've done activism work in Australia. Um, I'm a connector mm. so um I, I shake hands a lot of the time mm. you know meeting people that um are willing to bring about you know a better tomorrow mm -hmm. you know so i just spent um december gone in atlanta with martin luther king's son mm. um yeah. i work with the bransons philanthropically mm -hmm. um doing an adventure philanthropy um so that means i'm an endurance athlete Every like every year, I have to become an endurance. I have to throw away the delivery in the gourmet burger kitchen and all oh, wow. that. And I got to get onto the smoothies and be cycling like fifty miles a day at yeah. times. You know, you know, it's yeah. So it's a whole kind of performance poet. Yeah, you know. So I do performance poetry. I've recited in, at Cannes Film Festival in um, wow. in Morocco and yeah. festivals. Um, I do it in the UK. Yeah. I've done it. In so this so this is the thing, know. right? This is the thing that kind of throws me. Yeah. Just so you said you, you spoke in the beginning about building bridges. Mm -hmm. Right now you need to help me build this one because <laughs> how do you go from someone who literally ran a gang yeah. and was on the streets in yeah. Brixton yeah. to I'm now travelling and I'm now with the Bransons, I'm now 
doing talks at these amazing companies. I'm now shaking hands with some of the world's wealthiest. Mm. How on earth, because there might be someone here watching right now who is where you were mm -hmm. and is thinking, okay, you're making it sound very easy, but yeah. how, how do I get there? Well, how, just how? That's my main question. <laughs> if we even have enough time to even go into the depth I, I, I of the say, how. I would definitely say that um, I'd be a liar if mm. I didn't say I haven't thrown huge effort mm. and huge focus. Like those around me that know me um, personally know that I approach work without distractions. You know, so I have had seasons in my life where all it was was the vision and the mission mm. and I would dedicate every hour of my week to it. You know, I would forget to sleep, I forget to eat, I forget I've got friends and family. Wow. And I'll just grind towards that end. Mm. But even so, even so, that being said, like I've had to, um, I've mentioned before that I've had to change my lingual syntax just to be able to be a bridge to communicate and articulate. Mm. To, so being um, able to adapt. Yeah, absolutely. Guess, yeah. You know, so I, I, I became an autodidact. Basically means I was self-taught. Wow. And um, I would learn 10 new words a day. Wow. Um, I would read a book a week. You know, um, I became a sponge, really. You know, and um, yeah. I, and then I would use what I had informally learned <laughs> in a situation that could have destroyed me. Mm. So I've been very fortunate to be out of that. So I use it like I was able to read a situation in a moment on the street. I have to know whether you're actually coming to take my life. If you're coming to collect my life, because because you got a knife doesn't mean you're coming to collect my life. Mm -hmm. Because you got a gun doesn't mean you're coming to collect mm. my life. And I'm guessing when you were at that point in your life, yeah. those were the associations you Absolutely. had, right? So you thought someone's got a knife, that's what they're trying to do. No, no. no? So if they've got a knife or a gun, it doesn't mean that you're actually here to collect my life. Okay. So it could actually just be that you're just um, making a point or you're just doing it out of okay. fear. I had to be able to, you to know, read. calculate that. Right, so to I, read certain situations. That's it. So I okay. began to see the world in numbers. Right. <laughs> You know, so I, and it don't turn off. I can do that in the mainstream now yeah. as well. So I was able to superimpose wow. that, you know, so yeah. it's, it's, it's a flurry of things, but I'll definitely also have to say huge grace, mm. you know, because as I said, this time where I've worked hard, I've dedicated, but then some people have done more and not been able to have half, mm. you know, so there has been times where scenarios just put me in the right place and I've heard the right thing, you know, or someone's just said, you know what, I need to meet Carl Locker. Wow. They've literally been in their corner in another country, totally different geographical setting, mm -hmm. and it's just on them. They've woken up, they've seen something that like, maybe someone mentioned me or something, and it just keeps ringing to them. And they're like, I need to meet Carl Locker. Wow. And then they reach out, they make it happen. Like mm -hmm. their PA's PA gets in contact, mm -hmm. you know, because it would be a king or a queen in their own right, mm -hmm. you know, of sorts. And yeah, it happens that way, so... Yeah, it's been, I don't know if that's the answer, but yeah. yeah. No, it does, it, it definitely is, especially, you know, just explaining that you basically, mm. almost the life that you had was almost transferable yeah. skills. Absolutely. <laughs> almost. A lot of transfer. Yeah, it's transferable a lot. skills and using that. But Absolutely. I guess that's the main thing to kind of remember here that, you know, don't think that those situations can't be a positive in yeah. a sense yeah. and can't be used for better and for more. Yeah. And then obviously really going in and intense yeah. reading, yeah. knowledge, oh, building up it. your knowledge, building takes up it. your understanding. Takes it. That's amazing. Yeah, That's amazing. Um, and the only other thing that I guess I would ask you is if there's any advice that you mm. could give to anyone, you know, you kind of touched upon it quite a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, before, but just in general, there might be someone watching, as I'd mentioned, you know, who is maybe stuck in that particular mm. um, spot who doesn't feel like they can get out or feel mm. like they can move forward. Um, or even if you could go back, actually, and speak Ooh. to your younger self. Wow. What would you... So let's just try and encompass all of that wow. in, in one, because I think that was quite a big question. <laughs> it was. Um, but yeah, if you could just give any advice. For me, I actually would go and tell my younger self that it's part of the process. Okay. You know, I must be honest. I, um, my history is one where it's very controversial. Mm -hmm. I totally understand that, you know. Um, so I don't condone any of it, you know. I, I understand what was going on, even on a mental level. I can dissect it, but to justify it, wrong. 
but I do believe in anybody's life, no matter where you're from or what's going on, that is happening for you and not to you. I'm a firm believer of that. So a lot of the things that people want to change, if they actually change that, they will change them, you know, a mm. part of them that's maybe necessary for them to actually become and be. So mm. if I was to go back and tell myself, younger self, I would just, I probably would miss him. Mm. I'll probably watch him doing what he's doing yeah. and just ignore him and let him go about his business. Yeah. If I was going to say a bit of advice, a huge learning is that we're constantly becoming. Okay. So one of the reasons why I knew without a shadow of a doubt that as long as I was healthy and able, that I could change my situation is because... I had already changed my situation. Okay. So, uh, for example, the young man that my parents nurtured in, in that house in um, Brixton, mm -hmm. Oval, you know, it was a respectable young man that is a law-abiding citizen, mm -hmm. that doesn't use profanity, you know, that wouldn't even take an item from his father or give an item to his father or mother or any adult for that, at that with his left hand. Mm. You know, um, I went from that to a fully fledged gang member, you know, I was absolutely a, a, a rolled man living that life, you mm -hmm. know, and I had seen myself into that situation by taking small steps in that direction, mm -hmm. you know, by surrounding myself with those that was in that state of mind, like mindedness, you know, by aspiring, you know, by getting set and using that to be a setup for a comeback and just being resilient and just being dogged at my approach. So if I could go from that young man mm -hmm. <laughs> that my parents groomed to mm -hmm. one that essentially was groomed by, you know, Brixton, South mm -hmm. London, you know, underworld kind of mm -hmm. way, then definitely I can go from that and become something else. Yeah. You know, so people see me in the situation I am now and they're like, wow, that's that's a huge gulf, but it's even who I was then, like as a gang member, is a huge gulf to the young man that was in my parents' house, mm. you know? So I think like that's, that's what people are doing anyway. They just don't realise or give themselves the credit or right. take the time to acknowledge that, mm. you know? Like people are rebranding, reshaping themselves constantly. Mm. You know, they're not giving enough credit to how far they've actually taken themselves, you know? So I feel like if people really kind of acknowledge that, they would know that they can do it again. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, get wow. it done. That is amazing. Honestly, <laughs> just hearing everything that you said is so inspiring. And I, and I know for a fact that it will definitely motivate and inspire some people watching as well. So thank you so much for sitting down and Pleasure. speaking to us today. Pleasure. Honestly, you've been amazing. I wish you nothing but the best. And make sure you check out his YouTube channel um, because they're just amazing. Him and his wife, <laughs> Cassandra, they're just amazing. And I'm forever talking about them. Oh, so you. keep doing your thing. Keep being amazing well, and keep inspiring. No, so thank you so much to Carloco for yet another interview on BEB. We'll catch you again next time. See you soon. See you.